Welcome to another Scottish Greens podcast. I'm Lorna Slater, one of the co-leaders of the Scottish Green Party. Hello, and I'm Kate Wimpress, and I'm the convener of the First Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. This series of podcasts is all about picturing and, uh, and creating a vision for a positive vision for the future of Scotland. So I want to talk to Kate about what, how a citizens' assembly can fit in to a positive future for Scotland. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Can you just give us a bit of an overview for people who aren't familiar with what a citizens' assembly actually is? Of course, and Lorna, it's it's really lovely to be here. I know that you have been part of our Citizens' Assembly to date, so it's great to be able to talk with you um, at this time. Okay, so a Citizens' Assembly is, it's essentially a, a kind of mini public uh, from, in our case, it's a, a mini public from Scotland. So we've got over a hundred um, randomly, and I'm putting uh, inverted commas around that, randomly selected uh, people who represent the, the country as it is. So in terms of um, age, socioeconomic, um, I'm just kind of listen, listing my, uh, the, the characteristics I have, geography, ethnic group, political attitudes, ed educational qualifications. So, it, so it's a, a kind of a snapshot of the, of the country as it is. Um, and those hundred plus people um, are brought together or have been brought together um, over a series of weekends where they um, get to know each other, which is quite important. They receive evidence, balance evidence on topics. And then the, the key part of it is that they have a process of deliberation um, where they uh, talk through these um, topics and, and reach conclusions at the end. So in Scotland, uh, the first Citizens' Assembly of Scotland, which I've been convening, um, was set up uh, last August. It met for the first time in September and was to meet six times uh, to deliberate over three topics. One, um, a, a vision for the Scotland. Uh, what kind of Scotland do we want to build? Secondly, what, what are the challenges facing Scotland, um, particularly arising uh, from, from Brexit? And then thirdly, what, what kind of information do citizens need to be able to make informed choices for um, the, the future? So th those were the three aims of our assembly. Um, and uh, you'll be aware, obviously, that the COVID pandemic kind of got in the way. Uh, so we, we met four times. Um, and then in March, uh, there was a decision made to, to kind of pause our work. So I know the Citizens Assembly in Ireland was key to coming up with the question and the context for the referendum there on abortion. Uh, what has our Citizen Assembly been working on? Okay, so yeah, I mean, I think the interesting contrast between the Irish Citizens Assembly context and ours is that our remit was was really uh, kind of purposefully broad. Um, and I know there's been quite a lot of uh, dialogue around that. But the key for us was that the... Um, the citizens in the assembly themselves would kind of uh, further the remit. So we didn't want to set them a question that they would then try and answer. So we, it was it was um, purposely purposefully broad. Um, but to date, the um, our assembly members, our citizens, have been focusing on um, three key uh, areas. One is fair work and fairer taxes. The, the, the next one is a greener Scotland. Um, and the third one is this citizen information and improving decision making. So it's been quite interesting that a very broad church uh, representing the, the country as it is at the moment has come to, um, you know, has realised or has, has worked on um, quite a, a wide range of topics. But these are the three things that have really uh, come to the fore in their deliberations. And because the Citizens Assembly has been deliberately chosen to be broad and, and um, a cross section of entire all of Scotland society it doesn't and and it's driven by the members of it it doesn't actually have any particular constitutional stance on brexit or Scottish independence or any of those things no no it doesn't and I think that that was one of the the major reasons I mean, you know uh, one of our key principles is independence and um, so we are independent from government and we are uh, representative of the country and, and I think that's a really important point to make because we have got um, political uh, interests uh, of all persuasions and, and none, if that makes sense. So you've got you've got rank and file citizens from across the the political spectrum in looking at um, difficult things and kind of intractable uh, subjects. And and the the point is that 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 we can get to deliberate and work through difficult and, and seemingly uh, oppositional um, topics. If, so it's it's about uh, a kind of a creative 
um, safe space where people can discuss things in real depth um, and nuance things as well. And uh, so, as you mentioned before, just so we clarify for our listeners, I, I did get to participate and come along to the Citizens' Assembly. But of course, normally you keep political parties a long way away from the Citizens' Assembly because it's not about political parties. So can you just um, tell us why you invited us along on that day and what, what we did? Well, I think there was an appetite amongst the Assembly members themselves to, to kind of speak with uh, political parties um, face to face. So that was driven by the Assembly members making that request and... Um, Happily, uh, the majority of the political parties represented in uh, Holyrood were able to join us for, I think, I, I hope, Lorna, you can tell me how it felt for you, but it was a really open and refreshing session, actually. And I think part of, you know, part of the assembly work is that you recognise that there's, we have more in common than, than we have divides us. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective uh, as, a, as a participant in that session, how, how did that feel for you? Well, I think what really stuck in my mind wasn't so much the session, but actually after the session, I was on my way to the bar, or yeah, to the train, and I walked out of the building and I was accosted by a, a group of young women who were outside having a smoke and a chat, and they came up and grabbed me and they wanted selfies and they wanted to talk, and suddenly these were a whole bunch of women who would not normally have been involved in politics, not normally even interested in politics, possibly not, wouldn't even vote. And here they were, they had questions, they wanted to be active, they were suddenly interested. And so I think it's a really interesting way of giving a voice to people in politics who would never normally come near it with a barge pole. And I thought that was so exciting to get people excited about this, to make them feel that they had a say, that their opinions and their experiences really mattered. Yeah, yeah, well, I think, I mean, you've kind of, you've hit the nail on the head there, Lorna, because I think one of the things that is difficult to translate when you're not able to attend um, an assembly is is the excitement and the commitment um, of each of the assembly members. And, and you're right, I think, um, you know, we've been very much driven by uh, their enthusiasm to, to really uh, take this task on with incredible um, diligence and commitment. Uh, and also it, it demonstrates that this, yeah, this kind of fallacy that people aren't interested in politics. It's that I think the, uh, you know, that's one of the things that has come through as well is the, the need and the desire for the citizenship to have a, have a more mature political way of dealing with things and a, and a, a more mature debate with our politicians. I think, you know, it's, it's, I think there's lots of reasons for this, but I think, uh, you know, the press and Twitter and, and, and social media has not helped the calibre of political debate. And, you know, so then a lot of people are really switched off by it and, and just don't want to get involved in that kind of stuff. And it's quite easy to ignore almost. But whenever, um, whenever there's an opportunity and a chance to sit down and really think through, um, your own life in relation to other citizens and your own life in relation to how you want to see the, your own country, people are absolutely 110% up for it. Um, and, and it's, you know, so I think that's, so it's how do we, how do we then um, harness that enthusiasm? And you're right, these are, these are people who would, maybe you wouldn't expect, you know, wrongly to, to be wanting to engage in um, quite complex issues. How do we harness that enthusiasm and how do we then share that in a, a kind of wider capacity. Now I'm uh, excited about the thought of our 100 plus um, you know, citizens. I see them as, as kind of pebbles in ponds. So they're in pebbles in ponds, rippling out across the country. And that's, that's an incredibly valuable thing uh, to, to have happen. And I think that, so I, I mean, all of us who are active in sort of regular party politics very much live in political bubbles. And I think we do a lot, inadvertently, but we do a lot of gatekeeping activities, which makes politics look like, oh, it's not for me to a lot of people. You know, we're overwhelmingly white, we're overwhelmingly um, middle class, you can't throw a rock in a Scottish Green Party meeting without hitting three PhDs. You know, like, we're, we're not remotely representative of uh, you know, a normal person. And so normal people look at politics and go, oh my goodness, that's not for me. Uh, and I think that that's such a shame that uh, Citizens Assembly can go a long way to opening up politics. Um, I, I, I would be interested in what we can learn as, in, as party political people from the Citizens Assembly. How can we do better at bringing different voices into party politics, do you think? What have you learned about that? Well, I think... I think, Lorna, one of the main things is that you are almost um, forced into an adversarial 
uh, position um, by the way things are reported and by the way things are set up. Um, and even, you know, if you think about the way uh, the chamber works, it, it's very adversarial, it's very um, kind of winning, you know, one over and, you know, there's, there's many reasons for that. But the the interesting thing about the assembly is that it's the polar opposite. It's the uh, deliberative space. It's the collaborative and um, what do we share together, uh, you know, situation where people can, who, you know, maybe slightly anxious about sharing um, views that could be seen at uh, opposing each other. But but there's a space there where um, you can discuss, debate and kind of get underneath the uh, the banner headlines and the Twitter spats and all that kind of thing. Um, and I think if there's a way of, um, if there's a way, of, I mean, you know, it would take all parties to want to sign up and do it collaboratively. If there's a way of um, enhancing political debate where it is about um, collaborative action, then I think, you know, that would certainly help. Uh, and there's also the idea that you know, the, 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 there could be an ongoing citizens' assembly running alongside uh, the party uh, stuff um, so that you can, a soundboard, like a, a, a place to bounce off ideas that have, that, so there's a chance to, to really dig in and, and get into that more nuanced discussion, um, what does this mean for people on the street, that runs alongside the party political stuff because, because they really are two pa kind of parallel things. Because I think there's a big question in our society about whose opinions matter. And I think that it's been shown up in a huge way during the COVID crisis that we all clapped for carers and for nurses. And uh, we talked about essential workers and how we would all have been without food if people hadn't been stacking shelves and driving lorries and doing all those genuinely essential tasks. But typically we don't think of people in those professions as being decision makers, they, their opinion doesn't matter in political space. If you look at sort of governments chock-a-block with people who went to private schools, people who are very wealthy landlords, there's a real mismatch in, in terms of who society thinks their opinions matter. And I think there's, I hope the Citizens' Assembly goes some way into showing that all experiences are valid. People experience Scotland in different ways. And your experience is valid. This is something I tell particularly women all the time in politics is just like, oh, I couldn't possibly, I'm not qualified. It's like, no, your experience qualifies you. Your experience as a human in Scotland means that you know something about how you, well, you know about how your life works and you know something about how your community works and how your income works and how your housing works that no one else knows. And we need to hear from you. Yeah, exactly. I, it's the, it's, you know, because every, everybody is, has the impact of laws and the impact of um, how society is set up together. It has an impact on everybody. And um, so you're, you're an expert in your own life, uh, to use a, a kind of bit of a hackneyed phrase. Um, and it's not that, you know, we're, we're not expecting the assembly members to replace political um, uh, participation and, and politicians, because we have fantastic politicians in, in many cases. Um, but it's about it's about looking at it through a lens of your own experience and you're right it's that um you know i know exactly how a change to a school set up in fact impacts me i don't need to be versed in educational theory for that and um, so we've got a hundred and you know nearly 110 folk now who are able to go oh that's very interesting but this is how it plays out in my life and um, and the other thing is that that everybody's within the assembly everybody's voice is equal um and we go to you know, really long lengths to ensure that there is balance, that there's uh, equality, that there's accessibility, and that you know, I suppose potentially reflecting on on politics, sometimes the loudest voice wins, um, and that's not the way. That's not uh, you know, the assembly is the antithesis of that. It's about deliberative uh, space, and that everybody's voice is heard. Um, so yeah, you're right. I I, I think um, I've noticed in the uh, the run of the weekends of the assembly that sometimes. Um, yeah, some of the female voices have taken longer to come to the fore, but once the, the confidence has grown, um, you, you can just see kind of, uh, you can just see shoulders kind of raise and, and you know, an air of people going, oh my goodness, I, I know this, I know this, because it's my life. So of course, you know, it, and, and nobody can question it. There's, there's been a real kind of shift in um, the dynamic of the room where people who, 
probably themselves would never have thought that they would have been getting into the absolute center of this have found their place um, and it, it's quite a you know it's a, it's almost a it's an extremely emotional um thing to watch and be a part of how do you manage so i know myself in the scottish greens we're very uh we try very hard to get gender balance happening but even if you have a gender balance meeting it's it tends to be men who speak up first men who speak most and we have to go to reasonably extreme lengths like taking women first alternating between women and men if enough men have spoken saying no more men get to speak because we need to hear from women so we it's really hard even in a gender balance room to get women to speak equally to men how do you manage that kind of thing yeah i mean it, this is a an issue i think um that many uh, organisations find. Um, what, what we have is we so we've split we split the um, assembly members up into uh, tables and kind of designated tables so that uh, we we get a good mix of kind of personality types and, and, and gender around the table. And each table is facilitated by professional facilitators who are who are there to um, assess the uh, balance in the discussion and the debate and they you know they're trained they know how to pull people into uh, a discussion if, if they've not been maybe um, speaking up uh, as much as others but also we, we mix up the way people um, contribute so it's not all uh, verbal it's sometimes it's written sometimes they're working in pairs sometimes they're working as a table um, and then we can also have kind of collaborative things we've called canvases where um, you know sticky notes and all those kind of uh, techniques and, and um, opportunities for, for people to to step into the space if, if they're just not used to speaking up um, just uh, verbally and I think using all those techniques together we uh, are ensuring that there's a there's a balance um, from from all our members and I, you know I think as, as you've noted earlier on uh, the, the women have have been really coming to the fore and and really quite uh, verbal and vocal about what they want to see for the assembly going forward so if you look at some of the um, phenomenal uh, videos of our assembly members on, on the Citizens Assembly website, you'll see a lot of women speaking about their experience and about what they, they hope to get out of this. So what what comes out of the Citizens Assembly and, and does the Scottish Government have to take it on board? Well, the Citizens Assembly, it, we're working to the remit, so we will have a report of our findings at the end, um, which will be endorsed by the Assembly uh, as, a, as a collective unit. Um, that then is uh, passed to government and laid in Parliament, and there will be a debate on the findings. Um, so really it's up to the politicians then after that, Lauren, and I'd, I'd, I'd value your input on how the mechanisms of, of Hollywood works to you know, this is an important piece of work. Our assembly members have taken it into their hearts um, and have really put a lot of effort into it. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you think about, about how that may play out afterwards. Well, so I'm not a parliamentarian myself, so I don't know much about the mechanics of, of how parliament works, but I think it would be a real shame if the Scottish government was able to ignore that report. And I, I mean, legislatively, as far as I know, they can. They're not obliged to take any action on that. Uh, I think, um, well, I would hypothesize that the Scottish Greens would be trying to push the government to implement these sort of policies. It's the Citizens Assembly is something we definitely agree, believe in as a sort of philosophical thing. This is the first time we've ever had to deal with one in a practical sense. So I can see it being our role to try and push the government toward implementation of the whatever comes out of the Citizens Assembly. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's the big worry is that all this work all the time, the government go, oh, well, that was nice. We're still going to do A uh, instead, of, instead of changing course, because I, I can, my sense is from speaking to people in that room and, and always when you start to speak to real people is that some of the suggestions are going to be quite radical and no, and out of the comfort zone of sort of modern neoliberal politics. And I can see governments not being overly thrilled to kind of go, oh, let's chuck everything out and start over with what the Citizens' Assembly's told us. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, it is interesting. I mean, you're reflecting on the Irish experience. I mean, obviously, the politicians were probably emboldened by um, the output of the um, the Assembly, especially around the abortion issue. Um, and, you know, I that would be, I, I suppose, a personal hope for me that we would be able to embolden um, some uh, political uh, movement after the... the, the uh, the assembly reports and um, but, but unfortunately i have no i have no influence on that you know we our work is to get to this point and then and then we put it in now i'm i'm thinking um 
you know, nobody would have wanted the the pandemic to play out the way it has. But I think there is a level of debate around um, how citizens shape things, how local um, connections have become so important, how um, values have shifted. Um, and, I, you know, I, I've heard a lot of discussion from, you know, about the well-being economy, about localism, about, um, cir you know, uh, circular economies and, and community wealth building. And I'm, I'm just wondering if uh, the findings of the uh, Assembly, radical as they as they may be, and obviously I'm not an Assembly member, so mm. that's not up to me, but um, I'm wondering if the kind of Overton window has shifted a little bit um, and coincidentally the findings of the assembly may land um in government and with parliament at a time when when radical things can happen um, that would be very exciting well it, it's just uh, you know i'm reflecting on uh, a lot of the discussions that went on in the assembly prior to covid it's um, it's almost like they were prescient of some of the stuff that has now come into mm -hmm. um the, the kind of political landscape. So so I'm wondering if uh, some of those more radical things that our assembly members and our citizens are thinking about may find a home um, in this post-COVID uh, space. And what's next for the Citizens' Assembly? I think you mentioned that there's a, a green green Citizens' Assembly? Um, sure well, there, yeah, there, there is a, yeah, there is. Um, there's a separate to us, um, but obviously some of our secretariat will be uh, working with um, the uh, Green Citizens Assembly. So, uh, to to be fair, Lorna, I'm not a hundred percent sure where they where they are at with their work. We had the opportunity because we had met four times, and because our assembly members um, had had kind of come along their journey so far and, and knew each other so well, we had the the opportunity to, to shift online um, given the, the, the restrictions uh, in, in movement and, and gathering um, from the COVID uh, situation. Um, so, so we are moving online, which I think is a really exciting thing in itself. Um, but I think we were able to do that and I think we were able to take our assembly with us online because we have, because we, those relationships are already built. Um, the Climate Assembly uh, hadn't met, hadn't started, so I'm just not quite sure where they are at. I know that the UK Net Zero uh, Assembly had three meetings and then met in uh, met met uh, met online um, for their final uh, kind of convening, and that worked out really well. But I think that I'm not sure how it would work if you had never met. Mm. If that makes okay. sense. Sorry, I've yeah. gone off on a wee bit different of a Different vibe. No, different vibe. Absolutely. Yeah. So how does being online change how the Citizens Assembly is going to work? Um, well, we, we, we are to find out um, because we, uh, interestingly, in, in March um, and April, it became clear that uh, because we were traveling from all parts of the country and because we had, you know, 30% of our assembly members have underlying health conditions, many of them are elderly, it became clear that we were just not going to be able to meet again. Um, and there was a real disappointment in that because um, there is something about the buzz of the room and the kind of gathering of Scotland in one place. Um, it is an incredibly exciting thing to be a part of and, and just the, the kind of the buzz before you start. Um, so, so we had a bit of a, a kind of a gap in thinking around May time, and then it became incredibly important, given our remit, given the commitment of the assembly members, to get to get it back together and to finish our work. Uh, so a lot of um, discussion and thinking went on in the background, and um, it became clear to me that that we that we have to get back online. And um, I have to say, I was a, initially not an advocate for this. I was thinking it would be too much of a leap. Um, but looking at the uh, looking at the uh, net zero assembly, looking at the uh, experience of the assembly in France as well, who had gathered online, I, I really thought we had to give it a, a an op we had to try it out and give it a chance. So we we spoke to uh, a number of people who've been involved with those things, and then the key thing was to go to the assembly members themselves and say, look, you know, we want to do this. This is incredibly important work. It's it's probably you know. Can you have something? It's more important now than it than mm -hmm. it was. Um, mm -hmm. It was important then, but it's, it's really more important now. And and we, we went back to them and said, we want to finish our work. We want to finish your work. Uh, we want to go online. Are you are you willing to come with us? Um, and I'm really delighted to to report that 109 of our existing 113 members are are keen to come back online. And that 
that really spoke volumes um, and uh, and reassured all of us involved uh, that, that there was that this needed to happen. And um, so we're we're meeting again over four weekends, September through to the end of November, to to finish this work. Um, I think it's it's weird, isn't it? Because you know we've all kind of got used to this um, seeing each other on screens and uh, yeah, well, yeah. And yeah. for some people, it's more accessible. So well, this in some is... ways, uh, we're finding that people who wouldn't have been able to participate in person for all sorts of reasons, actually being online allows people to participate who wouldn't otherwise have been able to. Yes, Lorna, you're right. And it allows them to participate in, in slightly different ways. So I think it will be, you now we've got a research team working with us who are looking at the, um, the you know, how people engaged in, in the, the assembly process. And they're going to be watching how uh, uh, the, the, the kind of changes whenever we go online because it in, you know of, for all the challenges it brings it also brings a lot of opportunities as well because you can have you know pre-recorded information you can have um, speakers who are not uh, able who would never have been able to make it to, to the actual venue for the weekend um, and you can and you also I think um, you're right a lot of people feel feel more confident uh, contributing because because everybody is in their little square <laughs> across across the computer screen and that really works for some people so i so i and also the thing we've been able to to play on is that a lot of we were slightly concerned that a lot of our maybe older members were going to find technology um a, a bit of a barrier but as you'll know um many grandparents have been connecting with their grandchildren through zoom so there's a kind of a um uplift in confidence and, and access um, and we'll obviously be working really hard with all our assembly members to make sure that the, the digital um, uh, way of doing things is, is not a barrier um, and yeah I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out. We're also looking at um, tools where people will be able to um, kind of uh, kind of work together on collaborative documents and things like that as well and we've also got a space um, for the members to converse after uh, the, the formal um, assembly uh, convening sessions because um, again you'll know this from, from uh, party stuff uh, a lot of stuff happens in the coffee times and kind of it breaks and people get to know each other and, and we know that our assembly members will want to um, reflect on what they've heard and reflect on the discussion and the debate with uh, the, the formal online thing so um, yeah, so I think it's it's a real, it's going to be a real challenge, but I think the, the opportunities are manifest as well. And also, um, you know, your 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 uh, party members will be very interested in this in that it cuts down um, carbon emissions hugely because we're not bringing um, 110 people together from all over the all over the country. Now, sometimes um, that is the thing you have to do. But, um, you know, it could be that in assemblies of the future, you have this blend of meeting face to face and then working online, um, which will which will save, uh, yeah, save time, save uh, energy and um, will bring a different kind of debate to the fore. Brilliant. So I know our Scottish Green members will be really interested to follow the work of the Citizens Assemblies. How can uh, they find out more and how can we support the Citizens Assembly? Okay, so the best way for your members and anybody else to find out about the Citizens Assembly is to go to the website. Um, all our papers and all the uh, work so far is on that. And we've got an interim report that is, is quite an easily digestible um, report that brings everybody up to, to where we are at now um, to kind of give a, a bit of a launch pad into this next phase. Um, and also one of the things that really... Um, gladdens my heart every time I look at the website is there's the stories of the assembly members themselves and there's lots of little uh, talking head videos of people speaking at the assembly uh, meetings and also um, contributing their their thoughts um, you know in between meetings as well and I think it's it's that 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 I just it's such a rich um, website because it's really the voice of the assembly and it's the voice of the citizens so you know and that leads you into our facebook and our, our twitter as well so if you want to know anything about it it's citizensassembly.scot fantastic well thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today it was lovely lorna thanks so much for your time and you know uh i think this is an exciting phase ahead we've had huge challenges but but there's a real there's a real appetite for this now and i know our assembly members are really looking forward to getting back into the work Hand in line.